We have uh, Ken Westerbeck uh, from Toronto, Canada, my fellow Canadian, presenting on From Blocks to File Systems to Booting, How OpenBSD Makes uh, Bags of Blocks Useful. Oh, thank you. So first I want to say don't be too scared by that number 64. One, we have lots of time and two, there's lots of pictures involved so we should be able to get through on the, the normal amount of time. So what I'm going to be talking about today is the various levels of usefulness you, one can extract from a block device and uh, how OpenBSD can it and the tools you OpenBSD uses to achieve those different levels of usefulness. We have basically four do brief introduction, go through, gradually build up the higher levels of the usefulness, brief uh, mention of various ideas that have been suggested that we might look at improvement in the future, and conclude. So what we're going to be discussing is data structures that are used to tame block devices, uh, in particular the disk label, which describes partitions uh, that contain file systems, the GUID uh, partition table, or the GPT as it's called, the master boot record, the MBR, and the partition boot record, the PBR. We're not going to talk much about that one because it's mostly to do with floppy disks. Uh, we'll talk about some of the kernel functions that use those data structures. Uh, there's machine or architecture independent ones that apply in all the systems that we, uh, we support. Uh, read DOS label and check label are the ones that actually read the disk label and validate it or construct it. Uh, there's machine dependent uh, read write disk label that actually on each architecture write the disk label. We're mostly, or this talk is mostly about the, uh, the machine independent ones. The machine de dependent ones uh, are all almost identical, but there's three or four that are different, and we're not even going to bother trying to address the differences. And there's also device entry points for the various device drivers that provide block devices, in particular open get disk label and some IOCTLs. And finally, some of the user programs that are necessary to manipulate the various data structures and to sprinkle, <coughs> excuse me, sprinkle the pixie dust necessary to actually boot. Not going to be talking about extended MBR partitions, uh, not going to be talking about other or multiple operating systems, CDs, networks, DVDs, or as I said, the peculiarities of Spark 64, Mac PPC, HPPA, and Alpha, all of which have their own uh, very unique approaches. A uh, couple of important definitions to keep in mind. One, throughout the kernel, uh, there's a block, which is a dev B size, which is defined to 500, 512 bytes. The kernel sees all devices as a collection of these blocks and uses a data type called the D T uh, to address those blocks on the device. Actual devices usually have the same size block these days, but there are many and an increasing number that have a larger block size or different sector size. Uh, up to 490, the other popular one being 4,096 bytes. And a partition is a contiguous sequence of sectors which can have different meanings at different levels. So if the kernel actually detects during its probing uh, process a block device, uh, user land programs can abuse it without any further configuration. There's a sysctl, hw, uh, disk names that will list all of the block devices that have been discovered and their unique DUIDs, if in fact there is a DUID on the disk uh, to display. You can use that DUID, which is portable across whichever place you happen to plug in the disk, in most places that ask for a device name. The most common place is in the FS tab entry, or you can specify your partition, L in this case, that's not a one, that's a dot L, where you're going to mount that particular file system. Uh, there are, in fact, six block devices, uh, CDs, uh, which we're not going to talk about, floppy disks, we're not going to talk about, RD, which is the RAM disks that you use during the boot process or the install process, sorry. We're not going to talk about SD, which are SCSI devices, which is the vast majority of uh, actual block devices that appear VND, which is the device that you can use to create a block device out of a file, and that's used to build various images during the, the booting process, and WD, which is the old uh, ATA interface, increasingly, thank God, rare. 
enough information is provided by that block device for the kernel to construct IOs. Number of sectors that the device contains, the size of a sector, because it has to translate, the kernel has to translate between the sectors and blocks because it thinks of blocks, but the device thinks of sectors. And it creates during the pro process and getting the disk label, the initial disk label, a raw partition, which is traditionally C, and that is just a single partition covering the entire disk from zero to the last addressable sector. So that information by the block device is provided in a struct disk label, and which is 512 bytes long and can actually describe up to 16 partitions, which we'll get into later. In order to obtain that information about the block device, there are three uh, useful IOCTLs. Let's say GP for get. Physical, I think, is what the P stands for. And that returns the basic default information, the number of sectors, the size of the sector, and the raw partition. G uh, it just gets the information that has been most recently cached by the kernel. And RL reloads that cached information. Uh, GP and G are, obvious, are the ones that are most often used. If you wanted to actually use that block device, you would use pseudocode something like this. Being an OpenBSD program, you would, of course, pledge the minimal number of uh, POSIX subsets that you're going to use in your program. You would unveil, which is to, get, which is to say restrict IOs to the raw device. You'd open it. You'd get the, the, the disk label that tells you the uh, parameters that you have to work within. And then you reduce the pledge to the absolute minimum. And then you go into your work process. You just can L-seek, you can read, you can do stuff. L-seek, write. You have the whole disk uh, available to you. And of course, that means you can write a Turing machine, which means you can compute anything. Cumbersome, but you know, theoretically possible. Eventually, that becomes a bit cumbersome. And when that happens, you can abstract all of those blocks, as the kernel sees it, into a file system. And creating a single file system utilizing all of the sectors on the device is fairly straightforward. You just new FS the raw device, you mount it to some mount point. If you wanted it to be automatically recognized, you can add it to your FS tab. And then you can do whatever you want. Job done. Well, as far as, as, far as accessing the blocks, it is, but the device may have a GPT, an MBR, a PBR that has information on it, subdividing that disk into potential file systems that you may want to continue to use from OpenBSD. So the get disk label function in the MI area, or the disk drive area, calls an MD function, read disk label, which calls the MI function, read DOS label, which is the key function, and that checks the device for a GPT and MBR, MBR, PBR, and adds to the default disk label up to eight extra partitions reflecting what it found on the disk. Uh, this is useful if you're handed a disk that has uh, various file systems, MS-DOS file systems or whatever that you want to boot and then send off to someone else, but you don't have to write anything to the disk. You just use what's there. The open B an OpenBSD partition, if it's an MBR, is it A6, or much easier to remember, GPT DUID, are not spoofed. If there is an OpenBSD partition, that's handled separately. So what happens is that the sector zero is read. The read DOS label function first checks to see if it is, in fact, a GPT. And it first checks for a GPT because that's the most definitively defined function uh, structure that's got check sums and all this other stuff, which the other options do not. If it finds a GPT, it just starts reading the partitions and adds from I to P in the disk label up to eight partitions. If it doesn't find a GPT, it tries uh, testing whether it's an MBR. If it finds an MBR, it has up to four partitions it can add I to L, again, ignoring extended MBRs. If it doesn't find an MBR, it tries lastly, is this resemble a PBR floppy format, <clears throat> and if it finds one, it adds a single partition covering the whole disk. In the spoofing process, it's creating uh, partition descriptions using these fields. It, def it pulls out of the GPD or MBR a type, 
and you know they have various kinds in, in either format. It builds two 48-bit sector values, which is to say they're offset on the disk and the size of that particular uh, partition. And we have uh, two, defi two defines, two pairs of defines to get the offset or set the P offset uh, of the partition. It 48 bits allows many sectors and about 144 pair petabytes if you're using 512 byte sectors. Now we ended up with 48 byte bit, 48 bit sector values because we scavenged other fields in the disk label itself to find an extra 16 bits per 16 partitions. So we had a bunch of extra information. There was some spare, uh, deliberately left spare areas. There were some other fields that we got rid of. We found enough to expand the partition size and offsets to 40 bits, but not enough to go to like 64 bits. The kernel is capable of addressing up to in 64 max blocks, addresses, so it can currently handle anything up to and well beyond anything a partition can currently describe. So to get those values, it either reads the partition information from the MBR or reads the partition information from the GPT. In the MBR case, you have a DP type field, and two, a little ND and UNT32 fields as the start and size. These are sectors, not blocks. And for the GPT, you have, again, a type, a different set of types. They have 64-bit little endian sector values. So you can, in fact, in the GPT, describe a sector that can't be mapped into an OpenBSD partition, but we haven't yet to encounter a 144 petabyte disk drive, as far as I know. If you want to initialize a GPT or MBR, and you use the, the program F disk, and you can do dash J, dash <coughs> G, or dash I for GPT or M MBR. If you just want to display it, you just say F disk and then the unit. And if you use dash V, you get a little more detailed information. In particular, it will show both the primary, the secondary GPT, if they're present, and the MBR, so you can tell exactly how everything has been put together. If you wish to edit, then you can use uh, the dash E command. Over the last few releases, there's been a fair number of changes and enhancements uh, for reasons that we'll get into shortly. We recognize and can display the names of more partition types, uh, which have been appearing and confusing people. We've had to uh, specifically create a, create a specific list in FDisk saying, don't touch these partitions. You don't know what they're doing. Uh, and recently, we had to make even more enhancements there. We've had to relax some overly paranoid uh, GPT validation processes, uh, in particular around the size of the disk, because the GPT has <clears throat> the primary at the beginning of the disk and a secondary at the end of the disk, and we were checking to make sure it was really at the end of the disk. But if you copied a disk image onto a larger media or vice versa, then that would be cut off, and we were rejecting that, but we had to accept it. Uh, we enhanced <clears throat> slightly the display of the types by saying, this, this partition is Microsoft basic data instead of just printing off the first file system type that matched, which happened to be FAT12, and that was confusing people. Uh, we did the inertial implementation of GPT on AMD64 <clears throat> and missed one conversion of the little Indian to big Indian when we were writing it. So when we started working on the Apple M1, people got a little confused as to why the checksums weren't working. If we wrote them, it was okay, because we did it wrong. If we tried to read someone else's, it didn't work so well. Uh, we cleaned up some help functions where the, the long list of partition types was getting a bit too long, so we separated out GPT and MBR partitions. Uh, we no longer allowed ge geometry editing, which was an interesting feature that caused a lot of confusion and complications in the code, which was more concerning to me. Uh, we recognize and display GPT partition attributes. We were <laughs> the, the, the only attribute that was present when I implemented the initial GPT support was the one, was the equivalent of the active, DOS active. And I did that wrong, but no, one, no bias or uh, UEFI paid any attention, so that's okay. But we fixed that. We found that there were several new ones now 
So we now display the attributes uh, for debug purposes, if nothing else, with the dash V option. And we changed uh, the, the values that the user could input during the creation of, uh, of the GPT or MBR uh, to be blocks, which made more sense from the kernel side and was a consistent size instead of sectors where if you had a script that said create a partition a thousand units long, one would be eight times larger than you were perhaps expecting if it was on a larger uh, 4,096 byte uh, sector device. What we found just recently, last week, was that one of our developers turned on uh, an ARM64 device, discovered that their default configuration had 49 GPT partitions, all of which it needed for booting, except the 49th, which is the one we wanted to spoof. So we recognized that they were, in fact, kind enough to set the required attribute, so we now no longer try to spoof in, the, in those eight partitions, required, at, uh, required partitions, because the required attribute is meant to indicate this is needed by the hardware to boot. So we're not in any way, shape, or form knowledgeable enough to go in and change or affect those partitions, so we don't want to uh, waste time spoofing them. So that's working on a device that has multiple partitions, but still, we haven't written anything OpenBSD specific on the disk. If you want to have something like soft RAID, or, or, uh, or RAID 0 through 5, whatever, options, or swap space, or the best file system ever, the FFS file system, you may want to have more than eight partitions. And remembering our 49 partition friend, you may want a different set of partitions than the default one. Uh, create a journey spoofing process. To do that, you have to write a physical disk label on the disk. When OpenBSD is asked to do this, historically, it took a very straightforward approach. Everything was OpenBSD, everything else was wiped out. FDisk would create a default, depending on which one you wanted, GPT or MPR. It would take all sectors that are left outside of the uh, actual partition table and round bits to you know, cylinders or whatever it thought was appropriate, and wrote that to disk, wiping out whatever was there. Disk label then read the default label, uh, initialized either with one of its default built-in tables or a template file that you could specify <clears throat> with dash T, a complete set of partition partitions, and it would write that disk label into the DOS label sector, and it is actually a block value, not a sector value, uh, of the OpenBSD partition itself. And then the kernel subsequently uh, used the GPT or MBR to find where the OpenBSD partition was, validate, read the disk label from the location in that uh, partition, validated the disk label, and ignored anything else in the GPT or MBR. Once it could find and read the disk label, that's what it wanted to use, and it didn't care what else was on the disk. Disk label is the, unfortunately, slightly confusing perhaps, program name that it creates, examines, and modifies the on disk struct disk label. It uses an additional IOCTL, the W for write, which is also used by NuFS and GrowFS. Uh, you can define up to 15 user, you can define up to 15 partitions. The 16th is that C partition that is the responsibility of the kernel. You can't actually change that. Uh, FS tab tells you which partitions the kernel mounts. The disk label program can generate those entries with the dash F or the dash uppercase F or lowercase F options. One generates FS tab entries using DUIDs. One generates ones using the actual uh, unit value. And there's two more defines that pull out and combine into uh, 48 or 64 bit uh, values what the bounds that disk label is allowed to operate within. And you can change that if, if it turns out that you want to expand your coverage. Uh, recent changes to disk label 
include adding a new uh, keyword to the template files RAID so that people can more easily create soft RAID configurations when they're installing OpenBSD. Uh, two more fields have been garbage collected, BB size and SB size. Uh, one is on the way out, drive data, which is not used anywhere. And the, the, the default partition sizes are always being changed as disks grow and the particular partitions need more space, the user slash lib, user slash bin, whatever. So, well, the modern world is unfortunately a little more confusing than it was in the past. UEFI booting in particular. New platforms, the two that spring to mind or sprang to mind when I was writing this, ARM64 and RISC64. Now, when you're starting a new architecture, you want to support a new architecture, they'll say, here's an image. And almost always is a, a GPT formatted image that now has interesting partitions, uh, assumes that you can DD this onto any media and it'll just work. They don't care about the sizes. And they also have gotten into the habit recently now of using the EFI sys partition <clears throat> that we created very small, just enough to hold the actual boot program. Now they use that to dump things to allow them to do up firmware updates and all kinds of other interesting things. So we had to enhance, enhance FDISC. We added a, a new option, dash capital A, so that it would scavenge the disk for any of the partitions that were not on that protected list and construct the largest possible OpenBSD partition in the free space it found at the end of that. And a dash B option was added and somewhat enhanced to create the boot partition that is, again, uh, machine dependent. Usually EFI sys in the case of AMD64 and other uh, GPT systems there are a few other systems that have uh, FFS, I think LanDisk or LongSoon or someone does that. The read DOS label had to have the validity checks for the GPT relax so that we recognize these images. Uh, we were more careful about treating open, the OpenBSD partitions more like we treated the MBR OpenBSD partition. In particular, we didn't really care, we don't really care when we're processing the GPT, how big the OpenBSD partition is. We only want to know that there's at least enough at the front that we can find the disk label. Like I say, once we find the disk label, we don't care about what's in the GPT. And the install scripts have had, oh, and we also added uh, a feature to prevent writing the disk label on top of data that was configured in the GPT to belong to another partition, which was, problematic when we tried to do Apple disks. Uh, the install scripts now have a somewhat more flexible approach to creating the EFI system, so they can be larger where we have identified the fact that they are going to need that extra space. Uh, there's a lot of work going on to enhance the ability uh, for configuring an initial installation using soft RAID, and most of the install scripts have had all of, well, actually all the install scripts now use fdisk B instead of manually editing in a strange and delicate way, the creation of the uh, boot partitions. So again, we've now been able to create multiple partitions, file systems, OpenBSD can use that. But the ultimate use of any block device, of course, is to boot OpenBSD. So we have three possible paths. Not going to talk too much about the PBR. It's a floppy. It knows what it's doing, you know, whatever floppies do. And if you're right, if, sorry, if you're using a legacy BIOS, it goes into the MBR, which tells it how to find the BIOS boot program, which tells it how to find the boot program, which actually boots OpenBSD. In the UEFI case, it finds the GPT in which you've defined an EFI sys partition, in which there is the directory EFI slash boot, in which there is the boot something depending on your architecture, dot .efi file that actually runs in the UEFI uh, space and boots OpenBSD. The boot, I think I copied it, yes. So PBR, you know, we just copy that in place, it runs, 
the FDISC is responsible for putting boot code in the MBR if your architecture needs that. The, the BIOS, if you're running legacy BIOS, then reads that code, executes that code. The boot code loads BIOS boot from the first sector, or so for the first block in the OpenBSD partition. And then that calls boot. Now, BIOS boot is, is installed by something called install boot. And what install boot does is it looks at the OpenBSD system that has been installed at that point, finds out the inode location, et cetera, et cetera, where the file slash boot is, patches those values into the BIOS boot program, and then sticks BIOS boot in the first five. 112 bytes of the OpenBSD partition, thus letting BIOS boot know where boot is so that it can run boot, and boot is intelligent enough that it can read file systems and can boot the kernel and everything else. The user slash mdec slash mbr file is where that mbr code is. Uh, it used to be installed in almost all the architectures, and it used to include i386 boot instructions, which didn't make a lot of sense, so we've taken that out. It used to include uh, some partition information, which again has been taken out because that's now done by FDISC. And we removed an interesting mode from ESDI days where you occasionally had to hold the shift button down while you were booting so that you could enter the geometry of the disk. This hasn't happened in a while, so we took that out and it made the code simpler. So as I said, B-B -B allocates the EFI sys partition. Uh, usually it's an MS, well, all the times I know, it's an MS-DOS uh, formatted file system. Uh, install boot does that for Close enough? Not close enough? Not close enough. Oh well, I can hold it or I can find it. Let's see. I had problems with that audio just. Ah, okay. Seems to work, no? Uh, not so easy. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I can just talk like this. I can just hold it. Anyways, uh, we don't write into the NVRAM array that UEFI ins installations or implementations have that store boot images. We rely on that defaulting to the final choice, which is boot star.efi. So there's boot AA64 or something.efi, x86, x64, various ones. Enhancing that is an ongoing process, but right now we just rely on it, it going down and finding the, the default one, which can cause some interesting problems if some other operating systems have written a whole bunch of images, you can end up either not booting or getting somewhat confused. Uh, I think we already covered that part. Um, other changes in the install boot part of that process is that it tries to, again, as a result of more and more architectures storing stuff in the EFI sys partition, it tries to res preserve contents that do need preserving rather than reformatting the, the, the uh, partition un unconditionally. Uh, we are slowly trying to adopt more EFI sparts, uh, but that's an interesting process that I'm not personally involved in. Uh, and as I said, we're trying to improve the soft rate for uh, install process. So, as you can see, having done that, we have in fact done everything you want to do with a block device. <laughs>
a couple of important points that you have to remember is where the disk label goes. If you have a GPT, it will either go right after uh, or at the first usable LBA address, which is in the header of the GPT and it's GHLBA start, plus whatever DOS label sector block value is. If it's a non-GPT, MBR or nothing, it will go in sector zero plus DOS label sector blocks, unless, as I said, that block is being used by some other partition defined in the GPT or MBR. As of very recently, yes? Oh, okay. Getting quiet, all right. Uh, read, read, read DOS label was enhanced to do that check so that when write disk label says, I want to write a disk label there, read DOS label will say, well, I can't find a spot for you, so don't write it. It will only look in those two locations after checking for OpenBSD partition. As I said, if it finds the OpenBSD partition, it knows where the disk label has to be. It doesn't care what the rest of the, the uh, MBR GPT has. If you're writing a disk label to a disk with an OpenBSD partition, it will write it into that particular block. And the, obviously, you don't want to use that for anything else. And the FFS file systems have at least BB size or 8K bytes reserved for that purpose. That's why in your OpenBSD partition, it's always best to have the first blocks be the root partition, which is an FFS system and has that space reserved. If you want to kill a GPT, use fdisk-i to initialize the MBR. The reason for this is that because there's a backup GPT at the end of the disk, if you wipe out the MBR, the protective MBR, the GPT header the table, there are some very determined biases or UEFI partitions that will, even though they, they're not supposed to, will go and look at the end of the disk and say, oh, well, I found a GPT. This is what they really want me to use. And confusion results. It has resulted. The other interesting thing that can happen is that <clears throat> if you've written a disk label with no OpenBSD partition present, so the disk label is stuck in that DOS label sector spot just after the uh, GPT or MBR. Then you add an OpenBSD partition. It doesn't wipe out that previous disk label, so it still exists. It'll use the new one you write in the OpenBSD partition. But if you then remove your GPT or remove the OpenBSD partition or, or you know, remove it and then create it in another location or just remove it, that old disk label will then be read, which again, can cause some confusion for people. So you just have to be aware that tho those disk labels still live on disk. And if you happen to define <coughs> your OpenBSD partition where an old one was that had this, What, what if I talk and Henning just yells what I say? <laughs> Hello. So. So what you can do is create the create a disk label with 15 RAID partitions as the type of partition. Uh, you can configure a RAID zero device on each of those partitions, which creates a whole bunch of extra block SD devices, and then each one of those has its own disk label, which you can configure 15 partitions in. So in theory, you can configure up to 225 partitions on a physical disk, although it will appear as multiple, multiple devices. So in the future, or potential future, many constraints have been reached. Um, it, it has been strongly suggested in many quarters that it's time really to take a serious look at moving beyond what the current situation is Many suggestions have been made. This is sort of a random selection. More partitions. Everyone wants more partitions. 64-bit offset. I'm not sure how soon we're going to hit the 144 petabyte limit. Uh, uh, more spoof partitions. 
being able to recognize more GPT partitions and actually using them as opposed to just ignoring them if the OpenBSD partition is there. Further separating uh, the boot code uh, insertion into install boot out and moving it out of FDisk, uh, doing more EFI magic like writing the boot image name in the NVRAM, uh, making separate in kernel and on disk labels, not just copying the kernel structure onto disk back and forth. Um, <clears throat> eliminate more mixing of sector and block values so that uh, people realize that they're either dealing with blocks, the version or the vision that the kernel has of the device, as opposed to the, the, the physical information that the device uses. Uh, possibly multiple OpenBSD partitions. Uh, one, now that we have this, again, 49 partition device discovered, we're probably not going to be able to maintain a list of all these partitions and say, don't touch them. We're going to have to say, here's five partitions that we're willing to touch and just leave all the other ones alone. Um, there's a couple of expert modes. The usefulness of which is pretty dubious. And we're probably going to stop supporting the pre 48 bit uh, partition offset and size format, uh, which used 32 bit size and offset uh, values. And once we do that, of course, it'll be clear sailing for the rest of time. So basically, with a little care and meticulous planning, OpenBSD can turn those bags of blocks into whatever type of useful device you happen to need. And thank you for listening. Questions? Although. I now have the questions mic, so I'm not sure how that's going to work. <laughs> I think there's another one. There, uh, there is another one, but which one should I hold and therefore break? You can flip that one and I'll walk around this one. Okay. okay, questions? There's somebody up there at the very top. Getting some exercise. Thanks. Uh, hi, thanks very much for the talk and thanks for all your work on, on OpenBSD. Uh, you know the default values in the installer for the offset, you know, at the start. Um, is yes. there is there any plans or is there, I suppose, a, a reason why you, it's defaulted to 64? Yes, there is a reason. And is it... Uh, do, you want, do you want to know what the reason is or you, you were just curious as to whether there was a reason or not? <laughs> Uh, when that was done, we wanted that, what did they call them? Uh, various disks that pretended they were 512 bytes, but were actually 496 byte sectors. And we picked 64 as being the maximum value sector size that we could ever see in the future supporting. So we wanted to start at that so that it was at a sector boundary, which sped up uh, the IO. And Obviously, time has moved on, and perhaps that should be even larger, but that's why we picked 64 at the time. And, and uh, the reason why I was asking was about the boundary of, you know, with the modern SSDs, particularly the... It, there the, are, yes. Uh, time has moved on, and that has not been revisited yet, so yes. That's one of the reasons, uh, one of the fortuitous outcomes of choosing something, uh, 64, and using sector values at that time instead of block values, was there was a fair bit of space after in GPTs in particular between the end between the end of the partition table and an actual beginning of data. So when we wrote the disk label inside that sector, that was safe to do because we never allocated any space there. We only ran into problems when we started using GPTs produced by other people who thought that was a waste of space and put their file systems right after GPT. And we, you know, we ruined a number of Apple machines. Uh, during the, the, that discovery process. Okay. So yes, we would be interested in revisiting that. Right now, we're not. Okay. Thank you very much. Um. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yes, over here. Uh, hi. Um, hi. Any plans on uh, new red disciplines in the future? 
Um, sorry, new what? Like, like red five support or red six support? In, in the... Um, oh yeah, <laughs> that's way better, sorry. Uh, do you have any plans or news on uh, new red discipline support in the future? Not that I'm aware of, but I'm sure someone is thinking of it. Other questions? If you don't have questions, I have other exciting slides that, you know, this is what a disk label looks like. There's a C implementation. We can go through all, all the, all the uh, fields in a GPT header. That's exciting. So just motivation for, you know, questions. <laughs> Okay, no more questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.